We are Heather and Paul Christie. And for over 12 years, we've worked with executives and entrepreneurs to accelerate change in every aspect of their business. Because we are in the fastest paced business environment that anyone has ever seen before. So join us for the Evolve to Win show. Hey everybody, this is the Evolve to Win show and I am Paul and this is Heather. Hey, welcome. Thanks for tuning in. And our guest today is Ryan Vesey, and we're so excited to bring Ryan into the studio. First of all, thanks for being here, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Welcome. This is so cool. Um, so I wonder if you recognize Ryan's name. If you're a uh, a big hockey fan, you no doubt know who Ryan is. So he's a professional American hockey player who has played all over the world in I think seven different countries. Yep, yes, seven different countries. Um, still active, still active in the sport, and. He is just so tremendous when it comes to mindset that I want you to tune in and listen to some of the strategies that Ryan's used throughout his career, um, both in hockey and he's had quite an, quite an incredible career in business as well. So um, a, a few years back, when was, when did, when were you, uh, when did you co-found your clothing store? Uh, 2006. Okay. Yeah, it was, uh, we wholesaled um, our products. We actually didn't have a single location but we wholesale our products to over a hundred stores throughout the east coast um, and I ended up uh, selling the company right before I went to Russia uh, in 2010 so we me and my college roommate um, grew the company from uh, my parents garage uh, to wholesaling our stuff having a distribution warehouse in New Jersey having um, sales reps in uh, six different districts throughout the US and uh, we were managing that on the side while we were both playing hockey. So it was kind of a unique experience, but it was something that I think uh, was fortunate for us to give us a little sense of uh, running a business and uh, we learned a ton. I mean, yeah. everything, what I thought I knew at Cornell, uh, I didn't know anything <laughs> until I really got in there and started applying, uh, you know, some of the, um, the the strategy and tactics and even, you know, doing the balance sheets. and, and Yeah, and yeah the there's nothing like real like life that, experience, you know, so right? I, it's, it's, uh, a different ball game but uh, you know it's something uh, I'm grateful for because now I feel like it I'm in a much better position as I'm transitioning um, out of the hockey career soon and I uh, will be heading into probably a business career in some sort but well, yeah. cool well tell would would you mind telling us a little bit about um, how you got into hockey you know when you started you know you went to Cornell yep. played hockey there and well, then captain of the team captain of the your team, senior and year right and yep. moved into and got I would imagine got drafted so how, how did that all come about yeah so uh, I, I played junior hockey in Long Island New York I'm from there um, ended up going to Cornell University played for four four seasons there I didn't get drafted um, I was an undersized guy I'm five foot seven hundred and uh, 70 pounds for the listeners at home it's uh not a typical it was like hockey Gretzky, body. right? Yeah, I was a bit Gretzky. Was only not as, even as close to as good as Gretzky, but uh, yeah, you, you, you weren't the the great one. No, I wasn't the great one, but uh, that's what uh, me and him share the same body type, I guess, dimensions. But uh, yeah, no. So I went to Cornell, and then uh, out of that, I, I uh, it was the lockout year, so I really uh, trouble getting into the American Hockey League, which is the level right below the uh, NHL, where you get pulled up to NHL teams. Uh, I didn't have many opportunities there, so I had a choice to go to uh, the East Coast Hockey League or go to Europe. And uh, my agents and I thought it was best to go to uh, Europe. So I signed in Sweden and uh, started my career over there. And I remember, you know, getting in my car the first time in Sweden right out of college. <laughs> like they, they gave me the car. And I was like, this is unbelievable. I had this, you know, the techno Swedish music blasting. <laughs> you know, so, you know, at the time, there was all different music. There's no, like, iTunes, really, that was connecting everyone around the world. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it was really cool, and then... Uh, and so when you were in Sweden, did you go there alone? Yeah, so I went there alone. Okay. Uh, my wife, my girlfriend at the time, uh, now, now is my wife, but she was working in New York City. Um, so she was getting her career going, and I was getting my career going, and then uh, we ended up moving uh, full-time together, where she came with me to Finland in 2007. Um, but, yeah, so... so well, tell, got... tell, me about, tell me about the hockey the difference in hockey from college to go into the European leagues. I mean, these are incredible players, uh, European yeah. hockey players, and a lot of them end up going to the pros. What was the, what was the big jump, and what did you notice when you when you moved from college ranks to pros? Uh, certainly, the top end players are, are much much better uh, mm -hmm. than the top end players in in the university level. Um, but I think overall, the pro experience is a lot different than 
you know, you're going to school, your, your, your coaches are um, different. We had an unbelievable coach, Mike Schaefer at Cornell. Um, but pro hockey is just a little bit different. It's, you're a little more on your own. You're a little more responsible for your own uh, preparation, your own actions. And I think that's uh, where you really start to develop as a player and as a person when you can, uh, you're forced to do it on your own when you don't have the strength coach telling you exactly what to do to warm up when you don't have uh, mm -hmm. your coach telling you how we're going to do to prepare, you know, it's it's something that you have to find out on your own, and it's something um, I did and enabled me to be uh, successful. I think. So does that mean if if you have a higher level of independence or autonomy in doing things like your your warm ups, does that mean that there's a really um, maybe a, a different amount of effort that the players put in? Yeah. Like, did you really notice yeah, that? Yeah, there, there's certainly because uh, some guys believe that. Um, their preparation will lead to better performance. Mm -hmm. And some guys like just, ah, some days I got it and some days I don't. And they show up and they um, are at the, you know, I guess the, I guess the will of a uh, higher being or yeah. whatever yeah. to see if they have a great game or not. They're not in control of their own uh, destiny, you know. And I think the players who are really successful and the players who you see who play for a long time uh, figure out early how to uh, prepare their mind prepare themselves physically and mentally to be uh, successful. And I think that's where you see the biggest difference in consistency among players because they're would, able to do and that. Would you, would you say, just in your experience, that, that there's only a very small percentage of players in any you know, professional sports that can make it just on talent alone? Yeah. And, and I think uh, you know, when you get to the higher levels, everyone's talented, mm -hmm. right? Like you have to be have a pretty high level of talent um, to make it to the NHL level or play in the top leagues in Europe. Um, but I think um, the ones who really know how to focus that and uh, are the ones who are the great ones. And mm -hmm. those are the ones who can reach their own personal greatness. You know, for me, my ability, I, I was limited in size, I was limited in skill set. Um, I know for a fact my mental preparation and my mental... Um, being able to control my mind and thoughts was a huge reason I was able to be have a career as long as I, I did, did and uh, still going now. I'm hurt with a concussion right now, but I'm still, uh, you know, possibly coming back next season. Great. So if he goes blank, we'll just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. a moment. No, I mean, that's serious stuff, though, and it's not your first concussion. You've had a, you've had a number of injuries that have been obstacles, and it, it will, we really wanted to bring you on this show because of the tremendous lesson that I think all of us can learn in business and in life about how you can overcome obstacles yeah. with the power of mindset. And it just blows my mind. You know, you talk about when you said that, that you were kind of giving the formula that you found for those who were really successful, the first thing that you said is they know how to prepare their mind. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about the physical side. Yeah. So. I always like have this this mistaken belief when I'm watching pro athletes. I I, I know better, yeah. but I tend to think, okay, these are just you know the physically most fit, the best of the best, best physically. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, there's something much bigger yeah. than that. Yeah, and I think in sports, um, you have a direct result from how you prepare yourself. Uh, you can see a direct result. So, for example. If I um, do some mental things before the game to get myself ready, some visualization techniques, some um, uh, get my mind confident, you know, talk to myself, self-talk, uh, say things to myself in the mirror before I go on the ice, you know, it's kind of things that may seem silly to people who don't do it. Um, you really, you really gain a lot by doing that, and you see the result directly when you go onto the ice. So when you do it and have a, a positive performance right after. You start to say, oh, "Okay, was that just luck, or is that?" Just... And then, when you keep doing it, you end up to get yourself in a mental state, which is some people can call the zone, you know, or when people are really in the groove, when things just happen, when things are in sync, and that's you know, that's the trick is trying to get your brain and your mental state in that position as much as possible. And when you have the doubts, try to get out of that as quick as possible. And the people who can do that are usually the people most successful. And I think that translates. 100% the business. Yes. Um, and I think the difference why I think athletes realize it is, like I said, because they have a direct uh, feedback yeah. from the yeah. game. And if you're in a corporation 
and uh, you're doing your work or you have doubts because the boss is on you and you're feeling the pressure of the job and stuff like that, you may not see a direct impact of your work or of your mental, mm -hmm. um, you know, changing your mindset and becoming mentally stronger or something like that. But I think in sports, I was fortunate and I think a lot of athletes are fortunate to be able to realize the, the power of the mind by their direct uh, results on the ice. Or, well, and, and you especially, I mean, you've already described the fact, and of course we're sitting here with you, so 5'7", yeah. and yeah. how much do you weigh? 170 pounds. 170. Yeah. What, how does that compare with the average hockey player who you were playing against? Yeah, I was usually the smallest guy on every team. Uh, general height is over 6 foot, um, I would say, and, okay. and as high as, you know, every team has six three six four six five you know even up to six 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 seven you mm -hmm. know guys on on the ice especially mm -hmm. the defensemen are usually bigger and um you so know. you get some players who are a foot taller than yeah you guys are a foot taller than you and you know you, now. you gotta it's just incredible. You know, yeah. figure out you know ways you know there's players who are way more skilled than me you know players who are obviously bigger than me but uh I, I know I was able to do it because one of the major reasons was the mindset, and I, I was obviously had some talent mm -hmm. um, in my brain, how I saw the game and see the ice and knowing where to go, and they call that hockey sense. But um, mm -hmm. when did when did you know? When did you know that you could play in the professional ranks? So like was my it, yeah. so my dream and kind of how I've always kind of. It's funny because I've never really told anyone what I'm about to say, <laughs> but uh, oh my God. Let's breaking Let's news. <laughs> no, but like when I was a kid, you know, my, my goal was always like some kids dream of playing like travel hockey or junior hockey or even college hockey or the pros, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of, and I, my goal was always to like make the Hall of Fame. And that was like where I kind of always said it. And then when I was in college. From the time you were a young yeah. kid. Okay. And then when I was in college, I always had the dream to... Uh, make the NHL. So even when we were like working out in the summers as a college team and guys would talk about, you know, it doesn't matter or, you know, it, it's just the summer and stuff like that. I was always under the influence of this is not about now. It's about mm. getting somewhere mm. bigger than winning the NCAA championship or being, you know, all conference or whatever. You know, it's not, it wasn't about my it was never about that. It was always about getting to the, and then as you go on in your career, it's always about, you know, you keep adjusting your goals and, and making them, you know, whatever motivates you to what you want to be, yeah. you know, and you try to shape it. And if you don't get there, you know, that's, I never got to the Hall of Fame. You know, I only played a handful of games in the NHL, but I know that looking big and thinking big enabled me to um, get the most out of what I could. Yeah. You know, for myself. So that's, that's, I think that's the point, you know, you, everyone is going to have limitations, but you just got to try to make yourself the best you possibly can be. And so how much, I'll ask one more question okay. and then you can ask. So how much, um, did coaching play into your performance and where, you know, and how far it took you? Um, so I was an early age, uh, my, my first coach was like a carpenter, didn't know much about hockey, uh -huh. you know, it was just a dad helping out. Um, I had a good coach when I was a band of year, but, um, I had select really good coaches along the way. Um, one was Mike Schaefer at Cornell, four years with him. He's a phenomenal coach. Um, really helped my development, uh, skill wise, mentally, preparation wise, all of that. Um, my father from like an early age, he's an entrepreneur. Uh, he's a big thinker, positive mm -hmm. mindset. I mean, he really helped me, you know, um, with the focus part of the game, the mental side. He didn't know much about hockey, but just he knew much, a lot about uh, being prepared to succeed and and uh, really going after it and believing in yourself, you know, so mm -hmm. that, that those lessons there. But um, as you get in the higher levels, the coach is more responsible about um, managing the players. And um, the good coaches I've had have... Uh, done it well where they instill confidence in their players and they cl clearly identify what your job is and how you're contributing to the success of the overall team or organization if you're dealing with uh, a business. But uh, it's less about uh, so much personal attention mm -hmm. when, when I get to the pro, pro level. 
So from my experience, mm -hmm. I want to go back to what you just said and really translate that into the business world as well. So, you know, my, my thought here is you're asking about how much coaching played a role. I was thinking my follow up question was what makes a good coach, but you just let us there and you said a couple of things the great coaches would instill confidence in mm -hmm. their players. And yeah. I want you to think about that in terms of leadership and how powerful that statement is and how much it matters. You know, when you think about leadership, how you're developing the next generation of leaders, how much of that is helping them to believe in themselves, is, is really helping to instill confidence in them because sometimes it takes an outside person to yeah. really get you to see how much you have inside, yep. right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you said too is, they also really help to clearly identify your role on the team and yeah. how you can help the team be successful. Right. How many times in business do we screw up because things are changing so quickly and we haven't stopped to really help people understand, here's where I need you to play to be successful and to help this team be successful. Right. And if you can't get, you know, in the business world, you know, I have friends who, when I ask them, you know, what are you doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And there's stuff like, you know, they don't even really know yeah. how it's contributing to the overall organization All and, the time. and culture. And, it, you know, and that's a problem right yeah. there. You know, yeah. that's a lack of leadership right away. You see uh, from his boss not, not telling him, you know, how you're being effective and how your value is creating more value for the organization, you know. That's yeah, right. I think uh, how many professional athletes that are tremendously talented but because, and maybe they had the dream, maybe they had the dream of being in the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. but they just met up with the wrong coach or it's the wrong situation mm -hmm. or whatever. And because of that, their, their motivation, their own personal confidence drops and they end up giving up the sport because it's just not right. the right fit. Right. And, and it, a lot of times in, at the university level, you're stuck with the same coach for four years. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you come in, you know, I, I had dinner with a buddy last night. He was on a full scholarship uh, to a school and when he, the coach kind of didn't like him right away, buried him, and that was it. And this mm -hmm. was a guy who basically was good enough to get four years paid for his school. So this guy should have been playing, you know, at some level of pro hockey. But, uh, you know, yeah. a bad coach can... Uh, and for me, it, it, it just... I don't understand coaches who think like that, who think that, uh, you know, I just think they, they don't have any real thought on how to lead or how to uh, prepare a team or get people to get the best out of them. Because you have all these assets, all these players, and all the people who work for your company, you know, mm -hmm. in a business, and you need them. Yeah. You need them to be successful, and you're only successful if you get, the, the more everyone is the best of their ability, mm -hmm. the more your company is going to be successful. So it's, it seems like kind of counterintuitive to, like, bury people or that's such uh, a great point put people I, down I, I, it's such a great point and I think um, just what you said there that's maybe one of those little hidden secrets of great leadership and that is being able to put your own personal stuff aside mm -hmm. and to be able to assess your talent that you have and then being able to really understand how each people each person fits into what you're doing, whether whether it's corporate or right. it's in right. you know in, in professional sports, but the assessing. I mean, and you see a lot of professional coaches out there that bounce around. Yeah. They don't have good teams. They go to a good team or, or, or a lot of talent, but it just never pans out. Yeah. And I wonder if a lot of that is, and that's maybe one of the biggest pieces of leadership that a lot of people just underestimate. Yeah, and I think I think in uh, in pro sports, you know, for me, I 14 years pro, I've probably had three good coaches. Really? Where that I I you know and and respected wow. and, and and it's just really telling how many. Uh, you know, poor leaders there are out there, you know, and you can still win sometimes, but consistently over the long haul, you know, I don't think it really works. And so I that's incredible to me, and yet it shouldn't be. So, you know, the leadership is leadership wherever you find it, and that's true in corporate America as well. You know, you can, you can still be successful under poor leadership right. sometimes, right. Sometimes. But to be able to have that consistency, it's about those leaders who are constantly developing themselves and then in turn growing their teams, mm -hmm. right? Really mm -hmm. pouring into their teams and helping to de develop that, that confidence, that skill set. And what did you find? What, what motivated you when you, were, when you couldn't motivate yourself anymore? What did, what did you need from somebody else to help you? Uh, you know, it, it never really came from other people. Um, for myself, it was always from me, but there were, you know, there was times, there's certainly, I had many times of doubt, 
many times of uh, I had a couple of major injuries, uh, back surgery and a hip surgery in the same year. Mm -hmm. uh, I was out for six months recovery for each one back to back. So I pretty much missed a year of uh, recovering from an injury and then went back to play and I just wasn't the same. I couldn't skate and it was just became really frustrating because I couldn't play to the level I knew I, I, I was or, you know, I, it was pretty much, I thought I was done. And uh, trying to overcome that, you know, was, was probably the most challenging uh, time of my career where I thought, you know, this is it. And I said, you know, I'm going to give it three months after the season for the summer. And I told my agent, if I can't skate after three months, like the way I know I could, then I'm done. And I gave it all I could. And unfortunately, I was able to, you know, start feeling better. And that's what built confidence again. And then the mindset comes back to, you know, the positive thoughts come back and you start getting confident. And um, sometimes a little luck plays into it where you get a lucky bounce early in a, a, a game. But, you know, maybe that's not luck. Maybe that's you're generating that because of your mindset and mm -hmm. because uh, the puck finds you in hockey sometimes because you're, you're feeling, uh, you know, the law of attraction, <laughs> so to speak, yeah. you know. But... So that so I'm really interested in dissecting this just a little bit if we could. So yeah. you're talking about two major injuries back to back. You're out for a year. Any any one of those injuries could have put somebody out for a career. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like the way that you did it is you gave yourself a time limit. You gave yourself this three months of completely focused effort. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And then you said you put everything you had behind it. Yeah. How did you how did you muster that? Like what what were your daily routines to get yourself on the ice every day and get yourself to work that hard? Yeah, so mentally, um, you know, just just thinking, do you want this to end, right? Like, so I was playing at that time. I was probably ten years pro. I knew I had a lot of uh, game left in me. I knew I had a lot of uh, money left to be made uh, in terms of financially for my family. Mm. Um, I was playing at a really high level before that. Um, coming off one of my best years ever, uh, making more money than I ever made in my career. So I just, you know, I wanted uh, to, to go back at it and play again. Um, so you were of, hungry. You, yeah, like, you tapped so, into your why, it sounds like. Yeah, in terms of specific um, things I did, um, I, I remember writing down what made me a good hockey player. Mm. Um, reading that. Uh, I had it posted on my wall when I woke up, and it was uh, really what made me successful. You know, what are the key things that made me uh, be successful? And just putting myself in that mindset when I uh, woke up in the morning. What was your number one? Uh, being mean. <laughs> <laughs> as as a, God, I can't imagine you being as mean. A, it's kind of seems like kinda, than you. Uh, because when I I found throughout my career when I played. Um, when I hit more than I in, in hockey, there's contact, and when I used my body more, I was a much more effective player. Not because I was using my body, but it made me move, move my feet, and that was just a little thing I realized that. So when I played mean, means I want to go run around and hit people all the time. But really, it just it got me into the games early. It got me into the so I, you know, and then I went to the the rest of the game things that made me successful on the list. But yeah, be mean was was one of them, and it's kind of weird because you know I've only had maybe four fights in my career and not you know not known for big penalty minutes or, or not tough in any stretch of the imagination but, you know but it's your number that's one it. that's that's what kept you going. well the other the other thing too is at your age yeah. you're 35 mm -hmm. you're literally a senior citizen yeah. in professional sports yeah. I mean they are getting older and older Tom Brady's 40 now or yeah, yeah, 40 plus yeah. and Players are playing longer, and a lot of it is, I would imagine, because of just uh, a lot of the mental strength, but also the new, the different yeah. type of training, the diet, Absolutely. everything that goes yeah. along with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, and what I mean, that had to play into it as well. I like think, well, you got these young, you got these guys coming up. They're 21 years old, 20, 21, 22 years old, and I'm 30 something years old with a couple back injuries. Yeah. All of these injuries, that that alone would yeah you know for the most part bring a lot of people down yeah and i i kind of set a goal for myself too to play till i was 36 when i was going through that time mm -hmm. i said okay if i get back i want to keep going until i thought that was like a reasonable number 36 but when mm -hmm. i got last year i thought i was gonna play to 40 you know mm -hmm. so i wanted to keep going but at, at that time you know because i couldn't even imagine playing one year 
I said, let me get four years out of this. You know, I think it was like 32 at the time or something like that. But, you know, you're right. Um, and I took all the steps with the trainers and the nutrition and everything I, I needed to do. But, you know, fortunately it, it worked out. But, yeah. So, you know, I'm interested too in hearing about your leadership on the ice. So at Cornell, you were captain of your hockey team your senior year. And I don't know if you've held leadership positions in some of the other teams. Yep. Talk to me about what was that role like when you were out there playing a game? Yeah, so it's um, sometimes during the game it's difficult because hockey is very fast. You're, you're changing lines all the time, but a lot of um, maybe your leadership will come either in between periods or on the bench, okay. uh, in between shifts and stuff like that. Um, I think the first rule uh, for any leader, I think you got to lead by example. Okay. Um, you have to show the way. Um, you can't be uh, trying to hold people accountable when you're not doing it yourself. So. Um, I think you, you need to have the respect to your teammates by showing the way. Yeah. And then once you have that, then when you say something um, about accountability, if someone's not playing the right way or doing the right things that fit into the system or culture of the team, then it, it holds a little more weight because hey, you're doing it, you know, and people respect that if you're doing it. And then you can. Um, but my biggest thing, I think, is my ability to get my teammates to believe in themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's kind of where my leadership, I'm very positive. I was uh, a guy who always believed in the best, getting the best out of uh, my teammates. And, you know, it, a lot of it was to help myself, though, too, because you really indirectly, um, the most talk is with your line mates. And you see when they're down, when they're thing, you have to pick them up because they're helping you. Mm -hmm. and they're helping you succeed, too. Right. You know, so you're playing with two other forwards on a line. And uh, one of them is having a tough night, you know, and just getting in the doghouse maybe with the coach a little bit and stuff like that. And you have to kind of find a way to get them refocused because some people don't have the ability to get refocused. You know, they need help. Not They need help, and everyone needs yeah. help at certain points. And I think the quicker you can get refocused and get out of your own head, um, I think that, that was it. So I would, I would try to do that with a lot of my line mates and teammates especially. And so how did you actually do it? Did you use different techniques for different teammates? Or did you have like, you know, was there some line that you used to get people back in the game? Yeah, so every, every player and every person um, has different triggers which, which get them, um, which motivates them. So some, some guys you need to give a little bit more of a harder tone or, or you're not getting it done, kind of pick it up. Mm -hmm. You always say is kind of pick it up, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's go, and that's enough a lot of times, like, yeah. you know. And some other guys, you say, you know, you know you're know, you you're a great player. You know, you, you, you pump up their ego, and, and that's how you get them to be back in there, you know, with their shoulders high instead of slumping and, and stuff like that. So how did you learn those triggers? I mean, gosh, that's, that's everything that's, you're saying is so applicable to everything in corporate America and leadership. Yeah, no, because it's the same. I mean, leadership in any way, like you said before, is the same. Yeah. I mean, the coach of our, the best coaches I've had of the team could be phenomenal leaders in corporate America because they understand what it takes to manage and get the most out of, out of people, you know, and, that, and that's what it is. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah. So, so the how way did you, you learn know, those triggers? Yeah. yeah. So the way you, you you know is by knowing knowing getting to know your your teammates, your personnel. Yeah. You know, getting to know how they react when things are bad or when things are good. So um, just by observation, it's not as though you had your coach or some other outside um, consultant come in no, and no. do a one by one assessment no. and say, "Here's how to motivate this person." No. Yeah. So you just you just by on, just by ob yeah just by observation, yeah. and this isn't something like I wasn't going around the locker room to every person yeah. at all times. But if I felt like, and that's that's not real leadership either. If you're just like the guy just yapping all the time, it just falls on deaf ears. Yeah. But you know when when it needs to be said and it's said, that's when it becomes powerful. You know yeah. when uh, you find that guys are taking shortcuts. Um, within the game, taking, doing things not the right way, you know, and the, you you basically say, hey, you can't do that, mm -hmm. you know, and then they respond, you know, a lot of the time, you know, it's, and there's some people who never respond, you know, mm -hmm. and that's just the reality of the situation where they're, uh, and that's part of your upper management's job to identify those people and not have them in the organization because they're creating a terrible cancer for the, the rest of the group, but yeah. Yeah. So so let's um, switch gears a little bit with transitioning from your business. So now you're 
eventually you're going to be getting out of hockey yep. and you're going to be looking at possibly starting another business or yep. you're already in one. What is it? Maybe that speaking, I speaking, think you yeah. would be really good on the yeah. speaking circuit. Possibly. Yeah, modeling, you possibly. could do that yeah. as well. Sure. Right? Yeah. Sure yeah. Those who aren't watching this on video could be, yeah. I'm not sure about that one. So, what, so Ryan, what do you have on tap? What are you thinking about in the future? Um, um, well, my directionally, um, it's, it's just determining whether I want to stay within the game of hockey or not. Um, I've had uh, conversations about coaching. Um, wondered that. You know, um, in particular, the team I was on last season mm -hmm. um, inquired if this was going to be the end. You know, would you ever consider coaching? We had some long talks about it. It's something. Um, Which team is that? Uh, Alton was the team I was on, yeah. In what country? Uh, Switzerland. Okay. Yep, yeah, we were in Switzerland, sorry, yeah. And uh, so, co you know, staying within the game is, is an option, but, um, you know, my really my wife and family, we've traveled around for, you know, a, a long time now. So I think uh, it's time for us to settle down. Uh, so, you know, we built a home here in southwest Florida. Uh, we really love the area. I would love to be able to do something here. Um, I know my wife would love to be able to get back in, in the workforce. She's a Cornell grad also. She worked for Morgan Stanley and uh, OSG, so she's got you know pretty good background as well. And um, you know, I like to stay in this area. I'm really interested in healthcare um, mm -hmm. because of my profession, mm -hmm. um, because of what I've had to do to maintain my body, and um, I've had the resources and uh, in terms of networking ability to meet with some of the best. Uh, physical therapists, wellness people, um, you know, dietitians. Um, it's something I'm really interested in. I think uh, I'm going to explore a little bit in the healthcare mm -hmm. um, area to see what's out there and see if there's an opportunity where I can contribute. Oh, um, you're in a great place for healthcare. Yeah, for sure. I figured this would be a good, good, good uh, industry to be with down here. So yes, definitely. And how, and how did you end up down here? Uh, my wife's parents had a place down here in Bonita Springs. Uh -huh. Um, I used to come down to Sanibel as a kid and vacation, so we kind of knew the area. Um, once we started coming down uh, to visit my wife's parents, we really loved it. We, every time we came down here, we loved it. And uh, when I knew I was going to be going overseas to play for the rest of my career in Europe, we said uh, there's no point in paying uh, the New York State tax, you know. So we said, well, we come down here and enjoy life in uh, Southwest Florida. Come back after a cold winter and. Be in paradise, you know. So and you still was, get to hang out with all the Canadians. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. We got all right. the snowbird, right? <laughs> so I feel at home, I guess. <laughs> so, that's right. It, you know, it's always funny to me when you know when we came down here in Southwest Florida and in, in, in Arizona in the Sun Belt. There's a lot of hockey. That's yeah. now hockey is big down yeah. here in Salt Lake. There's a lot of youth leagues. There's a lot of uh, minor league teams that play. You just would never think that yeah. you know there would be a big hockey contingency down It's like the down third there. largest uh, district in all of uh, USA hockey. Is that right? right? Participants. Oh God, yeah. I mean, not even a lot that. of people well, don't know that. It's, no. it's huge. And so you could even coach down here. Yeah, know? possibly. Yeah. Wow. Possibly coach down. You take over the Everglades. Huh? There you go. There you go. Um, all right. So, I mean, I could talk to you for so long and ask you questions that just relate to business from a mindset perspective. Um, but if I could narrow down the one question I really want to know from you as you as you think about um, everything that you did from a mindset perspective to get yourself ready and in, in peak performance shape, um, you talked about visual, visualization and you talked about self-talk, which other people might know as affirmations, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you tell those who are listening who maybe are unfamiliar with this whole concept of visualization and affirmations? Why does that work? Yeah, it, what's your understanding of that? The the way I believe it works is because you're putting yourself in in the position of uh, what you're trying to achieve. So for me in hockey, I would look at the blank ice basically and visualize myself out there on the power play in the position I played, uh, scoring goals. If I had a chance to score, where I was going to put the puck. And that, that process, once it happens in real life in the game, it becomes like instinctive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really just be, be able to just let yourself play after that and you don't have to think too much. And I think so your when, subconscious mind yes. actually can just take over yeah. and play out your visualization. Yes, I think, I think that's what happens. I mean, that's what it feels like to me. And, um, you know, the science of it, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I believe that's what's happening. And, you know, if, if I'm doing... Um, you know, an interview or a meeting or something like that, or giving a presentation or trying to raise money, 
um, I'm doing the same thing. I'm preparing the same way mm -hmm. as I did on the ice, and um, that's enabled me to give some presentations um, that went very smoothly because, you know, I was able to, you know, it's just rehearsal, right? It's just a yeah. rehearsal for your mind. So it's a mental rehearsal. When you did these visualizations, did you actually go out on the ice and no, close I, your eyes, or you were in the I would always room? sit in the glass. I would always get away from everyone and sit either on the glass okay. uh, or stand on the glass or sit in the crowd and look at the ice or go on the bench and look at the ice before anyone was in the arena. Okay. Like when we get there early and, and do our pregame warm-up, I would just go out there and, and do that. And I felt of all the things I did warming up my body, that was the, by far the most important thing I could do, and that was what I did every every uh, game that and I, right before I went on the ice after warm-up so we go out for warm-ups we come back in the locker room they do the Zamboni and all that and right before we went back out I would go into the bathroom uh, splash water on my face and then tell myself how great I was in the mirror <laughs> pretty much <laughs> and so what you know, it sounds bizarre but I would just tell myself I was the best player you know to ever play or whatever. did you do that before you came out to the podcast no I didn't oh, you should have <laughs> that's, that's yeah that's one. yeah yeah I actually didn't do that one <laughs> We, we thought we heard water. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's why. Um, so, all right. You, so you would literally look at yourself in the mirror and yeah. say, I'm the best player. ice hockey player. To ever to play. To ever play. Yeah, ever. Yeah. And you think about that. As crazy that, as that sounds. Yeah. Well, and, but, but this is what the top performing athletes do, correct? Yeah. yeah. You weren't alone in doing this, were you? Nope. It works. It's proven. It's scientifically proven that this helps performance. Yeah. And I think that, that not enough people in corporate America are translating these proven techniques that all of these pro athletes are using, yeah. using that visualization. Whether it's visualizing a deal, a, a sales meeting, I know when I go, before I go on stage, 100% of the time, I go into that room prior to, day before, night before, when I can have a little bit of, of space, right. and I get, get on the stage, and I envision the entire room, and I fill it up with the people, and I have this moment, same yeah. kind of thing, yep. right? And I do the affirmations, and I do all of that. Yep. And, and one of the things that I always, when we train on this stuff too, right? One of the things that I train people when I talk about affirmations, you know, it's, it's your self-talk that when it's repeated enough, and with emotion is what causes it to sink into the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're battling whatever negative beliefs might be in there, right? 100%. And we all have the negative beliefs yeah. like that. Those seem to come naturally. Right. But we have to consciously choose the positive beliefs to overtake those negative beliefs or those limitations, right? right. And so that's what an affirmation is, is you choose something like you saying, I am the best right. hockey player that ever lived. Is that how you said it? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so, um, so by using that, what you're doing is you're replacing whatever limiting belief might exist, whatever doubts you have that are so natural with this power statement. And when you emotionalize that and you repeat it enough, it actually sinks into your subconscious right. mind. And that in your subconscious mind is way more powerful than your conscious it, mind. Yeah. So I think everything you just said is dead on. And I mean, if, from my experience, that's exactly how yeah. it feels. It's exactly how... And when the results come, you, you feel it. You feel like, you know, things just happen. When you're in the, when you're in the zone, you're in that mindset, things just happen. Um, I was in a really bad place mentally in 2007 when I was in Finland. I just got off to a bad start. And, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of people don't realize the pressure of being a pro athlete because you're pretty much one contract away from being done from playing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So so people don't understand, I think they think playing pro sports is great, you're a pro athlete, you have no problems, you know? But they don't understand the amount of pressure that goes into it. So there was all these talks of me uh, getting traded or getting fired, you know, I was in the media, you know, and things start building up. And I called my college roommate, the guy who started uh, Salmon Cove with, and I said, uh, hey, like I'm, I'm dad, I'm struggling, like I can't get out of this basically. I, every day I would try like the techniques and then I would get knocked down again, mm. you know? And he said like, you told me in college when he was out of the lineup to try to be the best defenseman in the league and not the best defenseman on our team. And he's like, why don't you try that? Try to be the best player in the league instead of just trying to keep your job on the team, mm. you know? Next night, you know, just one of these stories. Next night, it was been uh, 20 games left in the season. I ended up scoring 19 goals in the last 20 games. <laughs> oh my god! I, I was like in the zone, dreaming about scoring. Feel everywhere. I was just like completely in the zone. I knew I was going to score every night. The confidence like was through the roof. 
and things just happened. Like it just everything just came to me. I was getting goals that were just like handed to me. You know, yeah. it was just one of these crazy things of where I, that's when I like really realized the power of it. Where I was like, wow, like. So you stepped up your goal. You yeah. stepped up your goal, which stepped up your game. Yep. Right. Well, we did. You know, we we've done a show on breakdown to break through, mm -hmm. and it's just weird how the world works like this. Yeah. Like just. You almost have to have a breakdown where you're ready to just give it all up. You're you're scared that that it's going to be all over, right. and then next thing you know, every you kind of have to hit like rock bottom, right? right? And right. then from there you, you can just go right. right, and then the confidence comes back, you know, right. and and things just start aligning themselves, you know, when you make that decision. That, yeah, you know, so. Yeah, that's cool. So I want to just recap some sure. of the. I, I literally have pages of notes here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take them and <laughs> print them up and <laughs> keep kind of looking through them. But a um, couple of things that I just want to reiterate and remind our audience about. Um, first of all, that that in the success success tips that you shared, the mental strength, the mental focus seem to be at the very top of the list. Yeah. Right. And the way that you prepare your mind for any given game. Now, you had a couple of different things as you had, you know, you always had goals and your goals were bigger mm -hmm. than just what you were doing in the moment, mm -hmm. which I think is pretty incredible. And I think mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a great message to share. And I think it's just when, you, when I had the, like looking back, when I had the, and I never really like dissected this until we were just talking about that yeah. moment, but when you're looking back to the slumps and the negative thoughts, and it's be a lot of times you're in your own head where you don't, um, you can't even see the goals anymore. You're not even like you lose focus on what you're doing. You're just thinking about all oh, the am I going to get fired? Is this negative? And you know I don't feel good. My body hurts and all this stuff. You know, and then when you're playing great, you don't feel any of that, and you're mm -hmm. thinking about I want to play, I want to be a Hall of Famer. Yeah. You know, and it's just a matter of like stopping you know letting everything go and getting refocused i think yeah so okay so onto the goals that you're you yeah know. so so what a great what a great message that is 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 when things are going well it's so easy to stay sure. focused on the big right. goal but it's when things are not going well when you're in that slump that you have to more than ever keep the big goal in front of yeah. you remind yourself constantly i love how you said that that one of your strategies was to write down everything that made you a great player yep and you and you posted that so you yeah. could read it every single morning. So think about your waking thoughts. What are those waking thoughts you have? If you're not taking control of them, how many people just pick up their cell phone? Like first thing they do in the morning, waking thought is right. go on their social media and like pay attention to everybody else. How about putting a piece of paper together that you hang up in front of you that's why I'm awesome, yeah. right? And start with that. Think about the difference you'd have in mindset, in self-belief, self-confidence, self-esteem if we could just start focusing more on what makes us awesome yeah. instead of letting whatever happens happen. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Um, and the other thing too that, that I thought was really cool is you said, you know, at the, at the top, everyone's talented physically, mm -hmm. right? So, you, so you've got, and this is true in business all the time too, in every profession that you have, when you're, when you're at the top there, everybody's got a really good amount of talent, right. but what is it that sets you apart? What is it that has, has you make that team? That's where the mindset piece comes yeah. in. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's countless examples of on business. I mean, the top, you talk to any of the really, really mega successful people and they all have the power of the mind, unlike you know, anyone else. I mean, it's just, there's, this, is not a, this is not hocus pocus uh, stuff. This is, it works. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's clear. Yeah. You know? And I think that the last message that I would reiterate to the crowd, because every one of us goes through slumps, right? Mm -hmm. Every one of us faces these obstacles, and there are times when that obstacle's in front of you that it seems so big that you just don't even know how you're going to get past it. And, you know, like, take a note from Ryan. Give yourself a time period and work your tail off. Like, give it your best effort. You know, make it mm -hmm. a make it a whatever it takes yeah. is what you did. Yeah. And sometimes it's getting into that action that really helps you get your belief back, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a two-sided coin. It's the activity mm -hmm. and it's the belief. Well, I believe that belief fuels all of our activity, all of our behavior. And yet, behavior can totally fuel belief if you just get yourself into action. So, uh, man, That's great. 
your your lessons from the ice are just <laughs> awesome, awesome leadership and success hey, lessons. Hey, that'll be the name of the show. Lessons on the ice? Yeah. Lessons from the ice. Lessons from the ice. And, and just tell us real quickly, where are you playing out of right now? I mean, I know you're on a break right now because you have an injury, but... Yeah, so I was in, Swi in Switzerland this past season uh, playing in a city called Olten um, in the Swiss League. Um, yep, they're currently in the playoffs now. I had a concussion and... Uh, Teams let me go home and rehab in the sun versus mm. in the uh, rainy, cold weather of Switzerland right now. That's nice. So, you know, I was fortunate. My family uh, is back here with my children in school, so we mm. decided to come back. So, Switzerland, Russia, Belarus, um, Finland, Finland, Finland Sweden. Sweden. What's your favorite country? Uh, Croatia. 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 The best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the best. Uh, best year, uh, probably of hockey that I had. Why? In terms of. Uh, Location, teammates, coach. Uh, it was just a great situation. We overachieved. Our team completely overachieved. Um, family life. We had everyone had kids the same age. They like recruited all the same age people. It was just a great, um, great situation. Every time uh, we had a day off, we traveled. Croatia was so close that we went to Italy. We went to the coast of Croatia. Awesome. You know, Vienna. Uh, we were everywhere. So it was great. It was just amazing, amazing year. And the weather there is. Amazing. So. And last question, what's your favorite foods in Europe? Favorite food or cuisine? Well, I mean, in Italy, it would be uh, the rigatoni and matrasciana. That's my, uh, hands down, I had it probably six days in a row when we were there. <laughs> <laughs> Every meal. That's um, the spicy red sauce, right? It's got a little, yeah. sp a little spice, yeah, a little spice, but it's got like uh, some pancetta in it. It's mm -hmm. always great. Uh -huh. but, uh, yeah, but overall, uh, we eat pretty good. healthy. That was, you know, we went off the, uh, went up carbo loading. It's yeah. not usually a good thing, but, you know, it's, we eat pretty healthy, so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for being on. We really appreciate it, and um, I'm glad to have you and your family down here in Southwest yeah. Florida, and thank we you. really look forward to seeing what happens, you know, you getting back to hockey, but then once your career is over, what happens, because yeah. I imagine a lot of good things are going to. Oh, thank you. No, I, it was a pleasure being on the show. I appreciate it. I expect to see a lot more great things Thank coming you. out of you. And so um, to our listeners, this is one of those episodes that I say it, you probably want to go back and re-listen to this one again. And, and please share it with others who need to hear some of these same messages, especially those who you know maybe who are in a slump or they don't know what their what their next level is. I just think that your your message is so spot on. It's practical. It's inspirational, motivational. And, uh, and sometimes it's just great to listen to someone else sharing that information to kind of get that fire back in your belly. So please share it. Thanks for tuning in. And this was Evolve to Win with Paul and Heather Christie, and it's produced in partnership with Gulf Shore Business Magazine.